Oh, Lord. Find all of a sudden. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. My goodness, that is a lot of money. <laughs> My name is Julia House, and I'll be your moderator and MC for this evening and instead of organizing this event. I just want to quickly thank a whole bunch of people very, very quickly because this came together through much volunteer work. Tom Green, a student here, did his own printing, his own distribution. Terry Fuller, a professional printer, made the flyer. We have Tom McCarthy, who did organizing on behalf of Occupy, and all of our panelists came as volunteers. No one was compensated, so we had a lot. We also have Larry Knopf in Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences, who not only gave permission and made this event possible, but also gave advice and answered emails in minutes over and over and over again, because I'm annoying that way. Brianna JK, same thing. As soon as I thought of the email, she had already answered it. And uh, she did the press releases, so that's how you saw this in the Seattle PI, in the Weekly Volcano, and uh, on the radio. I heard a lot of people heard this this morning. So thank you very much for coming. And I would like to leave this over to Larry now to speak a little bit about the community engagement. Thanks. Thank Thanks, Cynthia. And uh, yes, this is an interdisciplinary arts and sciences community engagement forum. What the community engagement, what a community engagement forum is, is a forum that engages the community. The university has a responsibility to be a convener of uh, around issues and programs of community concern and interest, and that's one of the things we're trying to do here. I promised Cynthia that I was going to be very brief, but um, I went to her Cornell West last night at Green River. Was anyone else there? He was fabulous, and he was not brief, and he inspired me uh, in a bunch of ways. And I decided I wanted to say a thing or two about the importance of this event. Um, so please indulge me for a moment. Um, you know, Cornell West had recently been released from jail after being arrested at an Occupy demonstration, and he'd just come from visiting the Occupy movement in downtown Seattle when he spoke at Green River yesterday. Uh, today, He's visiting Occupy Oakland and Occupy Berkeley, so for all I know, he's been arrested again. <laughs> um, but he actually didn't talk a lot about the Occupy movement directly last night. Uh, so since I and many others who went were so inspired by him, I'd like to briefly connect some of what he did talk about to what I think is going to be happening here tonight. One of the many things that Dr. West talked about was the difference between schooling and education. Schooling, he said, is important. It's about acquiring key knowledge and skills that one needs to pursue a vocation and to function effectively in the world. But it is not the same thing as education. Education is something much deeper, having to do with critical analysis of oneself, of society, of the world, of human life, and of the place of humans in the larger universe. And education is ultimately about developing an appreciation and understanding of our individual and collective callings and purposes. It's about the really big things. Life, death, meaning, and making a difference during our short time on this earth. In this respect, Dr. West pointed out that central to education is love. And not just love of knowledge or of other people, or of life's many superficial pleasures, but most importantly of truth and justice. Because it's through the love of truth and justice that we find meaning and purpose and a connection to the world beyond ourselves. We live in a moment of profound crisis and change that cries out for education as opposed to schooling. Real education of the deepest kind is driven by the love of truth and justice rather than by fear or desire. The Occupy movement, it seems to me, offers that kind of education. It's history happening right before our eyes, and it's bottom up history, bottom up education, not top down. 
Now, it's important not to confuse education with educational institutions. Obviously, those of us who've made our lives in educational institutions like to think of ourselves as transforming lives in the world, as truly educating as opposed to just schooling. And at our best, that is what we do. But we are also inevitably and invariably and inescapably deeply embedded in a social and structural context that is a status quo. And since all status quos are never just or truthful, far from it, we're part of the problem too, and profoundly in need of education ourselves. We need bottom-up truth-tellers, bottom-up lovers of justice to challenge us, to unsettle us, and to keep us honest in an unjust, untruthful, and dishonest world. So it's all the more important that at moments like this, we in the academy be the students, not the teachers. That the learning be from the bottom up, and that it be collaborative, not from the top down. And that's what I see tonight's event as being, education from the bottom up. I'm pleased and I'm humbled on behalf of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at UWT to be supporting this event. But I want to say that I don't see it as something that we in the university are doing for the community, despite the fact that it's built as a community engagement forum. I really do see it as a moment of deep and profound education, which is to say a moment of unsettling challenge to all of us, but especially those of us who think of ourselves as having the calling to teach. So I want to thank those involved in the Occupy movement who've come here to educate us in a most democratic and collaborative fashion. I also want to thank the students, the faculty, and the staff associated with IAS's Ethnic, Gender, and Labor Studies and Politics, Philosophy, and Economics majors who have done the hard work necessary to put this event together, especially Dr. Cynthia Housen, who really spearheaded the event. But tonight, you and the movement are our teachers, and we are all each other's students. Finally, I'd like to briefly make a plug for another IAS Community Engagement Forum, which will be held on Wednesday, January 11th at 6 p.m. here in this room. The forum is about truth and justice. It's on recent cases of wrongful conviction here in Washington State, with a particular focus on how wrongful convictions happen and what can be done to minimize future risks of them happening again. Panelists are going to include Stephen Ross, Dr. Stephen Ross, an IAS psychology major, faculty members from the UW School of Law, representatives of the Innocence Project Northwest, and Pierce County Prosecutor Mark Lindquist, as well as a recently exonerated, wrongfully convicted individual from this area. <coughs> and Paula Whistle, the law and justice correspondent of KPLU, will serve as a moderator. So with that, I'm going to say thank you, turn the proceedings back over to Cynthia, and I really look forward to meeting you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, so I will be as brief as possible as we want to speak tonight, but I do want to let you know a little bit about what our panel is and give you a, a little bit of a background of what we have planned for you tonight. We've got a great show for you tonight. So, uh, each of our illustrious experts will, will speak for about five to seven minutes, and I'll, I'll let you know a little bit about who we today and them are. But um, we'll be handing out no cards during that time. And that is two different opportunities for the public forum. And it, it seems like it's important to have different styles of community engagement and different opportunities for community engagement. So if you have questions, we're going to ask you to write your questions on the note cards. And that way, the first half of the following those three presentations, we'll be asking those questions in order to be able to feel as many as possible, and in order to be able to allow those who might be quieter a chance to express their question and a chance to uh, express any, any of their thoughts. After that point, we'll have the actual open topic. We've got mobile mics, and we'll be passing them around. So that being said, I just want to give you a quick rundown of what we have because we have a diverse panel of experts that have a lot to offer tonight. So beginning with Dr. Michael Foreman, who's a political theorist and an expert in 
labor studies. He won an award from his book on the international labor movement in 1991, which is widely published. And he's going to have a chance to place the Occupy movement in a broader global context for us. From a totally different perspective, we have Sean Dill, who's representing Occupy Tacoma. And he will excite those of you who represent Occupy Tacoma. Many of you came here today because we're curious. We wonder what's going on with Occupy and gosh, what's going on with the economy. And one of the things that we'd like to do is give a sense of what governance is like in the Occupy movement and what it's like to be in the Occupy movement. So Sean's going to give us a bit of a demonstration and you are free to participate or not in that demonstration, but I wanted to uh, warn you a little bit about that. He also, by the way, <laughs> writes for uh, JustGibberish.com, which brings together a very new point to discuss social and economic justice. So we have quite a diverse array of perspectives on social and economic justice. Our faith based representative for you this evening is Mike Collier, who has 30 years of experience also working with social and economic justice. He's a pastor with First United Methodist Church. He is also the former chair and co-founder of the Micro Project, which is a nonprofit working in economic justice. After that, we have Jennifer Kopp, whose expertise is in two of the areas in which many of us feel <coughs> most confused and most concerned, and that's taxes and houses. She is an accountant, and she's a real estate agent, and she has seen much of what challenges many of us. She, with an eye on probably the resolution specialist, and if you know what that is, you know more than I do. But I can say that she's given her expertise to the Residence Advisory Board under George Bernard W. Bush for the tax policy. So she's had experiences in various sides of the market and is able to give us some great insight. Those of you who know a little bit about nonprofits know what it takes to be the kind of person who builds a career in a small nonprofit. And you'll appreciate Jake Carton, who's been on staff with Jobs with Justice for 10 years. He's also been a community organizer and a union organizer for more than 20 years. So he has experience in many, many of the major labor issues that have happened in Washington State in that time. Finally, some of you will know Autumn Jacobs. Autumn is not only a representative of Occupy Tacoma, but also of the Wake Up 253 fame. So you'll have noticed her as a co-founder of Wake Up 253, which if you're interested in supporting local businesses or finding out where local bands are playing, you'll find that with the museum in many local businesses. With that, I'll ask you to give everybody a round of it. Either, either could be 
the Occupy model because I see Occupy as a very radical global movement whose spirit cannot be contained in narrow demands. But today I want to do is share my sense, and this is just my sense, I am no expert, uh, of what Occupy means. To begin with, um, I want to put Occupy in a little bit of a context. Occupy is the American expression of a global movement. The inspirational founding event took place last spring, first in Tunisia, then in Egypt. Mostly young people, committed to nonviolence and inspired by uh, a yearning for justice and for freedom, occupy public spaces. By occupying physical space, they created symbolic and political space to challenge established ways of thinking and established ways of doing. Fast forward to May 15th this year, thousands of young people, inspired by Tahrir Square, take over Plaza del Sol. This is the central, most important intersection in Madrid. They're going to be there all summer, occupying, opening up space, so that new discussions can take place. They challenge political corruption, they challenge the ideologies and the practices that put market performance criteria ahead of all other values. From Spain, the spirit of our time, uh, the German term is Zeitgeist, it's a wonderful term. Zeitgeist travels around the European Mediterranean to Italy, to Israel, and from there it hops over to South America. Eventually, two months ago or so, this Zeitgeist arrives in New York City. From there, because New York City is a major media center, it spreads around the world in a whole series of global actions on October 15th. This is very fast, by the way. What I am suggesting is that all of these events share certain things. They share a demand for freedom as it was presented that Marcuse quote that I gave you. They share nonviolent tactics. They physically and symbolically claim a space, a new space, in the socio-political universe. They're all also largely made up of young people at the core, and lots and lots and lots of other people like me who wish they could camp out. <laughs> in some ways, Occupy is similar to the last global movement. That was the 1960s youth movement. Like that movement, occupies global. Young people are in the lead. And the movements are expressing a refusal. They refuse to accept the claim that there are no alternatives. In other ways, they're different. First, symbolically, Occupy inherits both the good and the bad outcomes of the 1960s. They are, in a sense, the children of the 1960s. Second, at least in Europe and the United States, conditions are really very different from what they were in the 1960s. Economic conditions in particular. The 1960s had a different agenda. It was the liberation from the affluent society. Today, economic, the economic security of the 1960s was replaced by economic precariousness. Economic precariousness that has grown out of 30 years of free market oriented policies. Today, the movement is experimenting with new forms of social cooperation. Uh, anyone who is interested in politics should visit the Occupy camp. Everyone should attend at least one general assembly. These are new ways of thinking about how you organize social cooperation. In sum, what I'm suggesting here is that the occupation is a global movement and it is, in a sense, the embodiment of a spirit. But it also is different in different places. In each locality, there are differences. Things are done a little bit differently. And that's a good thing. Because that's part of the new model that Occupy is exploring for us. It is a truly radical movement whose vision, I think, 
has yet to become concrete either in a theoretical expression, which is the sort of thing that I do, uh, or in an explicit set of alternatives. But that's not really the point. Because Occupy, to me, in a sense, embodies those alternatives. And even if nothing else comes out of it, and I don't think that's the case at all, but even if nothing else comes out of it, the occupation has already succeeded in creating symbolic space where entrenched economic practice, practices and politics as usual can be debated critically and creatively. And that, I think, is already a tremendous accomplishment in just a few months. since its inception. Um, I was also involved in Occupy Seattle uh, for a couple weeks. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I was brought up in a, a fairly conservative family, uh, and I kind of rejected that right, uh, as soon as I got old enough to kind of see other points of view. Um, I'm one of those youth who campaigned hard and did a lot of work to get Barack Obama elected as president. I caucused for him, and I became very active in the Democratic Party at the time. Um, and I think like a lot of youth and a lot of people in our country, um, I became very disillusioned and I felt like uh, I, my voice was not being heard and I felt like the change that was promised wasn't delivered and I became very apathetic and very upset um, for a long time. Uh, until just very recently when I saw uh, the Arab Spring and I saw what was happening in Tahir Square, uh, I thought to myself, why can't that happen here? Why can't we have that kind of change here and that kind of activism here? And almost seemingly out of nowhere, the occupation started in uh, Wall Street. And the second I heard about it starting in Seattle, um, I watched Beef Vendetta, I watched uh, Say Guys, I got myself all fired up. And uh, I went up there and uh, I've been going gung-ho ever since. Um, I truly believe that this is a movement that can have change the dialogue in America and to some extent it already has. Um, I believe that this kind of change is not only necessary, but um, without it, uh, humanity might go in a direction that none of us want. Um, it's, it's very important to me that this happens, and for me it's not only about political and economic change. Um, for me this is also um, in line with my spiritual views and my views about how humanity views ourselves in regards to the world and in regards to one another. And so I think this is kind of an awakening um, of our consciousness, of our collective consciousness, and kind of a change in how we see the world. And um, it, it's kind of allowing us to step back and say, okay, you know, we've, we've bought a lot of things and we've consumed a lot of things and we've, we've spread all over the globe, but what's next? What do we do after that? Um, do we keep consuming? Can that go on forever? Um, and I don't think so, and I think this, is, this movement is about changing that dialogue and helping people not to only realize how our government and how corporations may be disenfranchising us, but how we've disenfranchised ourselves um, and how our apathy has led to the situation uh, that, that we're in. So that, that's just a little bit about me and my views, and um, to preface that, I'm going to give you an idea of how um, the occupation works and our democratic body works down the occupation. Anything I'm saying right now, unless approved by our General Assembly, that's our democratic and governing body, um, is my personal opinion. It doesn't reflect the views of any of the other occupants. There's a ver variety of views and opinions um, that are present at the occupation uh, on all sides of the political spectrum. So just keep in mind that anything that us occupiers and the people up here say tonight is a reflection of our personal views of the occupation and not the occupation as a whole because it would be impossible, I think, to put it in a couple sentences for you to even speak for the occupation as a whole. Um, and just to give you kind of a little idea of how we do things at the occupation, I am empowered by the General Assembly to give you our mission statement, and I'd like to do that um, in the style that is, that is done at the occupation, which is called the People's Might. Um, and it is... Uh, 
it, it requires community involvement, so if any of you want to kind of speak up and be a part of this, um, you're welcome to. Um, the way it works is going to say something and then everyone's going to repeat it and that's so that people really think about what's being said and so that we can kind of have a collective voice and voice everyone's opinions with the same volume. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to give you our mission statement via the people's mic. Mic check! What? Mic check! Occupy Tacoma is part of a peaceful and non-violent movement. After the tradition of great activists of our past. After the tradition of great activists of our past. Fighting to end the corporate abuse of democracy. Fighting to end the corporate abuse of democracy. Our mission is to identify and implement solutions. Our mission is to identify and implement solutions. To rebuild a healthy and thriving community. To rebuild a healthy and thriving community. For everyone. For everyone. Combat both the silence and propaganda. We're here, We're here to combat both the silence and propaganda. Of corporate backed media. Of corporate, corporate backed media. media. We aim to bring attention to the disastrous impacts. We, we aim to bring attention to the disastrous impacts of unregulated corporate activity. Of unregulated corporate activity. On political. On political. Economic. 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 And environmental systems. And environmental systems. By exercising our constitutional rights. By exercising our constitutional rights, a free speech, a peaceable assembly, and peaceable assembly. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm, I'm Mike Collier, and uh, I'm, I was asked to talk about faith a little bit. One of the things before I even say that was in 1990, I ran for U.S. Congress for the last. And so I've been involved politically in town for quite a while, but it's always been the core of my faith that has uh, kind of dictated my where I uh, invest my time. Uh, I too was part of the uh, exception of the Tacoma Occupy group, and I want to say first of all I'm honored to be a part of that. Secondly, I'm very privileged to be a part of this uh, discussion tonight, so thank you very much, EWT. In the beginning of October, I, I was sent by my employer to Cincinnati, Ohio, and at that time, um, I had to go sing at the cathedral in, in Cincinnati. And on my free time, I went to see the Occupy group, and we started talking. There was a bunch of people there that uh, actually were people of faith. So he talked about possibly writing a statement. And so we came up with a statement of those who were part of um, the faith, faith community to uh, kind of uh, made the proclamation. This is what they came up with, or we came up with um, together. And it is, uh, to all, we view the movement as a continuation of the biblical prophets who have gone before us and wish to work in the tradition of the civic prophets of recent times, such as Gandhi, the Reverend Berrigan, Coffin, and Dr. King. That said, this issue is so vital we must speak out. We must, we must become a voice in the wilderness that crescendos into a war for justice. We wish to bear witness to the economic violence that is taking place in our land today. We wish to bear witness to the impact upon those who are oppressed, marginalized, and have no voice. It is our call to stand for them, to be heard, and to petition for change. It is our call to venture beyond our comfort zone and perhaps occupy the cities, the towns, and yes, even the jails. We wish to do this to embolden others to join in the song of justice. We call upon our government to govern with compassion and the humility of spirit, to lift all to a just standard of life. We call upon our government to bridle the greed, to police the powerful, and make room for the voices of the poor and the middle class. I, because I express my faith within the Christian tradition, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the different traditions of Christianity. And it's a little bit of a historical synopsis. In 1891, um, the, the encyclical Rerum Novarum was uh, promulgated by Pope Leo XIII. And in that, he talked about the rights and duties of capital and labor. And he supported the rights of labor to form unions and rejected unrestricted capitalism. <coughs> this, was, uh, this was backed up in 1961 by John XXIII, who talked about uh, the positions of the economic powerful uh, compared to those of the poor. Particularly, he was talking about 
those who live in uh, depressed areas of the world, uh, basically what you call economic slums. Talked about the uh, duties of those who are what are considered the haves towards those who are the have-nots. The, um, the United Methodist Church, the part of the church that I expressed my, my particular faith in, was actually was the first Christian church in the world to have an actual social statement. And so it's called the Social Creed, uh, promulgated in 1908. And the, the synopsis of that basically is the, for the rights of all, economic stewardship, the principle of conciliation between labor and management, the abolition of child labor, the standard work day and work week, and a fair wage. <coughs> Finally, in uh, 1986, the bishops passed a letter on the economy by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. It was the longest and most widely spread worked on document ever in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. It was a six-year six -year work in progress. It was formulated by economists, by lay to clergy, civic leaders, welfare recipients, bishops, and uh, folks from other denominations. It's the most debated document in the history of the Catholic Church, and it talked about three questions. <clears throat> what does the economy do for people? What does the economy do to people? And how do people participate in the economy? It called for an urgent need of economic self-reflection. It also spoke very deeply about Christ's preferential option for the poor, preferential option meaning care. And the synopsis of that is the, it is a preferential care that is a divine praxis that extends to all victims and non-persons of history. Furthermore, this praxis of preferential care is not only grace for those who receive it, but also a demand for those who follow Christ. And where does that leave us today? It leaves us with a deep, deep divide in our world of the haves and the have-nots. Never before have there been such a wide disparity. The call of the progressive church community, meaning all faiths, Christian, Islamic, Jewish, is that we do care. It is our duty, it is our call, it is our privilege to stand up, to work for justice, to call to mind to those who aren't listening at this given time to listen, to join the call, to join the cause. And we do that in the memory of the prophet Micah. Do justice, love mercy, and walk home with our God. Thank you. <laughs> well, my name is Jennifer Call, and uh, I don't know how to follow this. Uh, I'm not here because I'm at the top of my field, and uh, I'm not here because I'm the best and brightest. And I'm not here because I'm a great public speaker, which will become so evident before I'm um, I'm here because I believe in this cause, and uh, that came as a surprise to me. Um, as much as it may have come as a surprise, as a surprise to any of us. As I watched on the news and on my computer screen, this movement growing and taking form, it started out with me as, uh, what are those people doing? What, what are those people, what are those people protesting? And what are those people not listening for? And, and look what those people are causing. And um, it slowly began to dawn on me, not too quick, um, that I was one of those people. That I was one of those people that, that wasn't standing up for what I knew was right. I, wasn't, I was one of those people that was allowing myself to be carried along by a current that I didn't agree with and that, that felt increasingly wrong to my spirit. Um, and it took a big effort for me to overcome that feeling of not wanting to be a part of those people and, and transforming that into knowing that I was a part of those people. And I think that that's what's happening at our core, is that this 99%, um, it takes us a little while to realize that we are the 99%. It takes us a while to realize that the fingers that we're pointing are focused on a very small segment. Um, and in another part, I'm here today because my industry, uh, the real estate industry, 
is a pivotal point in this whole movement. Um, ideally, when I started in this industry, I was part of the American dream. I went out and I helped people find and buy their home. And uh, it was all a feel-good thing, which was opposed to my other hat, which was in taxation, <laughs> where I helped people fight against help people fight against arguably the biggest collection agent in the world, the IRS. Um, so on that hat, I was involved in some of people's biggest traumas and um, disasters. Unbeknownst to me, I was going to see real estate move in the same direction, which was um, going from part of the American dream, um, serving the community. It used to be that we built communities by, by helping people find their homes, and helping sellers sell their homes. And in the meantime, I would collect a commission, hopefully, and uh, support my family and contribute to the community and the form of the consumer. <coughs> And the people that I've helped, the buyers and the sellers, the builders, would again help form the community and contribute to that sense of community through not only building the community but contributing financially. Um, and the banks, the banks profited in the local bank and they would lend, they'd bring in money and then they'd lend out for that dream to continue. Um, and then the government would collect the taxes, which again I would have to work on that side. Um, and they would serve the community. We would all build the communities together. And somewhere along the line, that dream got fragmented. Um, somewhere along the line, a few people decided to prey upon the tendency of us all, which is to want what we don't have, to live beyond our means. They fed on the fact that we saw things that we wanted that other people had, and we believed that we had to have them as well. And a, a very small minority developed means to, uh, to feed on that, and my industry became a vehicle for that feed, for that greed. Um, the credit default swaps, the badly bundled paper, the derivatives, things I know nothing about, um, became a means for the, the top 1% to, um, to feed off of negative human nature. And so here we are. I'm part of the problem, but I'm also part of the solution. And we're all part of the solution. And I think what's happening, at least from my perspective, is that and it is a spiritual, it is a spiritual base belief. That, that we are all related. We all have this relationship, and we've forgotten our relationship. When we move from being a community and being related and understanding how we can to say, I need, and I want, and I'm focused on myself, we are part of that problem. And we're seeing it from the top down, but we're also seeing it from the bottom up. And it's going to take us stopping pointing fingers, um, even at the 1%, and it's going to take us saying, we need your help, because we are the 100%. And we need to finally bring that back into a relationship. Uh, my industry now is starting to see a transformation. We were uh, arguably one of the worst devastated industries as a result of the economic crisis. And remember when it started out as the mortgage crisis? It, it was the mortgage crisis initially. Um, and then it grew to a recognition that everything was messed up. We were, we're messed up from, from the top down. And uh, we all have to take responsibility. We can't. We can't live beyond our means. We, we signed contracts and took out loans that we never should have taken out. We were fed these loans by bad business practices. And the government turned a blind eye because, honestly, the government is bought and paid for by campaign contributions and feeds off of the lobbyists and caters to those lobbyists. And until we decide to work together to turn this entire process around, we, we're going to suffer. Um, I look at it as we are the sleeping giant. In my term, in my my faith, is that you know we're finally waking up. We're finally waking up to the fact that we are all in a relationship. That's what we're designed for. That's what we were created for. And it's eternal. It's not. It's not that we are physical beings temporarily living a spiritual life. We're spiritual beings. We're temporarily living a physical life. And it is eternal. 
and it has to be fixed from the bottom up, the top down, to stop pointing fingers. Um, my industry now is, is seeing a resurgence of, of potential, and we're, we're back, we're getting back to basics, where we buy our house um, for our home. We're, we're seeking the security again of, of having homes and families, things that we got away from for a really long time. And it's, it's kind of encouraging to see that aspect. And this whole movement is so, I think that's why it has, it's taken the legs that it has, is that people from every, every point are seeing the value. They're seeing the relationships that need to be redeveloped. And they're, they're taking um, an active responsibility for their own accountability in, in making those communities. And so uh, there's, there's a lot of work to be done, and thank God for all of us being here and being aligned in, in doing that hard work and uh, doing it peaceably and uh, just, just working as hard as we can. And I am very, very honored to be a part of this whole thing. This is my first, I was a child in the 60s, and this is my first attempt to ever be a part of any sort of protest movement. It was, it was really hard, and I was appalled when I got down to 21st and Pacific and realized that Whole Bank of Bain's commercial office, which I am working for, was right across the street. <laughs> <laughs> now, that said, I, I'm not easily deterred, and I think that's why we're all where we are, is because we're not easily deterred. Um, we see a need, and, and God bless us all, we're, we're willing to work hard enough take responsibility for making it happen. And I just, I applaud all of you. Because clearly the 99% in some way, we're all in crisis here. And some of us might say we're in crisis because the 1% designed an unjust system. Some of us might say the 99% let the 1% design the system. Some of us have been fighting a long time uh, and we, didn't, we don't feel like we let the 1% design uh, design the system, but they designed it anyway. So how do we change this situation? Every social movement, I would say that has accomplished incredible change, has changed the equation between the 99% and the 1%. We're in crisis, they're not. They need to start experiencing crisis. And in a nonviolent way, <laughs> in a way that Occupy has done across the country, they have disrupted the enjoyment of the 1% of all their loot and all they took from us. And for this movement to grow further, let's face it, this is, this is a major risk-taking moment we're in. We are going to have to escalate the disruption. However uncomfortable that might make us feel, and however uncomfortable it makes the 1% feel. And, and where, where we're going with this, 
is we want the 1% to share their power with the 99% so the 100% can redesign a better system, right? right? That's where we're going with this. Jobs with Justice is an organization, uh, 46 different local coalitions across the country. Our mission is to disrupt the 1%. We've been doing it here in Tacoma Pierce County, trying to do it for 17 years. Um, we take direct action, nonviolent, uh, directly putting pressure on decision makers, corporate, 1% one percenters. Um, and we are very excited by the Occupy movement. I, I know we see a lot in the corporate media about what Occupy Wall Street is doing and what other companies are doing. I want to get a sense, because we don't see it so much in the corporate media, but we see it on our, in our own media, right? Our, our own communication. How many folks are seeing Occupy Wall Street march on Goldman Sachs? How many people have seen those clips? Or, or Occupy Wall Street, Occupy the playground of the rich, Broadway, Times Square, go to the mansions of the CEOs and the bankers. Do we see this on corporate media? No, right? We see the pepper spray and the police, and, and that helps us, you know, surface stuff. But really, what Occupy is doing across the country that's scaring that S out of the 1% is the other stuff that corporate media is not broadcasting, which is the, the marches and the, and the occupations of the suites, the corporate suites, like in Philadelphia when they occupied uh, Comcast Bank, or, or sorry, <laughs> Com Comcast Corporate Headquarters, or, might as well, right? <laughs> or, uh, or in Oakland when uh, Occupy took over one of the busiest ports on the West Coast and shut that down, and you know, virtual general strike, or in Occupy Portland, where they marched at midnight through the luxury condos. You know, if if uh, we can't dream, we're not going to let them sleep, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that, that we need to be thinking about locally here. And so I want to talk local right now. I'm going to name some names, too. We have our own 1% here in Tacoma. And they're right down the street, right here. So let's talk about that. The largest corporation in the world, the most rapacious, Walmart, is trying to invade Tacoma now. What's the, what's the company that is, is doing a lot of the public relations and pushing the city council right now to, to give Walmart a special loophole to come in? BCRA. They are kitty corner, their offices are kitty corner to the Occupy Wall Street Park right now. Okay? I mean, sorry, Occupy Tacoma Park right now. That is the PR firm, the architecture and engineering firm that has uh, essentially, um, you know, they, they built the Walmart or they designed the Walmart in. Uh, Federal Way Super Center, they tried to get the one in, in Fircrest, that the Fircrest community uh, stopped, actually, so we can win, right? Um, and they are the ones here moving the Chamber of Commerce to put the pressure on the City Council to cave on the big box ban. Let's talk about another one. This might be a little controversial. There's pickets in right now, or you know, every day in front of the grocery store five blocks from here. The grocery store that hands out coupons on this campus for, for students to shop. And uh, essentially, and I'll put this in perspective, um, each Tacoma resident on average spent $100 bailing out Chase Bank. That's the TARP, right? Each Tacoma resident, on average, spent $100 subsidizing that development that that grocery store is in. That's corporate welfare. What do we get for it? The developer turns around and brings in a, 
a grocery store company that has a track record of violating workers' rights. Multiple federal uh, indictments or grounds for indictments of uh, violations of worker rights. This company um, is getting a, a, an incredibly low rent. The city is leasing that space to the developer uh, essentially one dollar a month for 99 years. Pretty sweet deal. I wish I had that rent. So, so we could go on. There's a bunch more examples. Marriott uh, Hotel right here is another. So we welcome you know, the escalation and we hope we can bring the pressure on these developers and 1% here in our community. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm really not a public speaker at all, and I didn't prepare anything for this at all. I'm kind of just speaking from uh, where it's coming from. The reason that I'm here uh, with Occupy Tacoma is because for the longest time I have uh, been a fan of documentary film. Um, about a decade now I've been watching some pretty intense documentaries with lots of information and it, it, buckets of information that you would have to sit and weed through for days to find the truth past the bias. Um, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I, uh, you know, I, don't, I try not to take things to the extreme, but it's pretty obvious that our representatives are not representing us. It's, it's pretty obvious that money is what controls everything, and personally, I hate money. Um, I also consider myself kind of one of the lucky ones of the 99%. I don't have student debt. Um, I have very little credit card debt. Uh, I have a house, I have food, and you know, a support system that is kind of intense and unreal at times. But every single person in this room and every single person that is affected in any way, and even whether you think you're affected or not is, is irrelevant, you're being affected. Every single person needs to stand up and say something if they, if they see something wrong. It, it's our duty. Uh, it's, it's necessary. Nothing's going to change if, if we don't speak out when we see somebody being unjustly treated, unfairly treated, disrespected, disenfranchised. Um, somebody's, you know, flailing on the ground in obvious need of help. Or, are we all going to just stand there and watch them, or are we going to do something about it? So that's why I'm here, and that's why I live at the park, and that's why I'm involved in Occupy to Come Run. I'm hoping that we can change the world with a little bit of love. Particularly, um, we're doing direct communication with the Zaykes movement or the Venus Project, but I would venture a guess that many people who are part of the occupation are aware of Zaykes and aware of the Venus Project. Um, and 
uh, have probably Here's seen some of us are, what, what's the guys, the zeitgeist? What, what does that mean to me? Some of us are. Oh, the zeitgeist is a series of documentaries that deals with um, religion, um, social movements, and the monetary system. Uh, they've been released on the internet, they're free for everyone to watch. Um, they're very informative. Um, they're kind of one of those things, uh, or I caution that you listen to it with a grain of salt because some of the things they say can be fairly um, radical. So you kind of have to watch it and pick out the parts that are, are a little bit less radical. Um, the Venus Project is loosely affiliated with Zeitgeist and it's, it's basically the idea of a resource-based economy. Um, it's a way of getting rid of the monetary system as we know it and basing our economy on a more direct democratic principles and having our economy be, being based on the availability of resources and not who controls the wealth. Um, but those, those kind of ideas are, are present in the occupation as, as are a number of other ideas. So I would say that they're not so much communicating as those ideas are ingrained in, in the movement as well as part of, as part of the collective voice. So. The next question, and I think anybody with experience will volunteer quickly. What do the Tacoma police and city administrators think of Occupy? What has been the tipping point between peace and violence at other Occupy movements? Seems like police brutality is an issue. Anybody want to take a stab at that? <laughs> I, I, I can answer that as well, I guess. Um, I've, I've been to several of the occupations, um, Portland and Seattle and Tacoma. And um, each occupation has its own relationship with the police. And fortunately in Tacoma, our relationship with the police has been very positive. Um, they've been extremely helpful and extremely um, willing to have a dialogue with us if they've ever had an issue. They've come down and said, okay, this is the issue we have, and we've been very quick to correct it. Um, that's not the case for a lot of the other occupations, as I'm sure a lot of you have seen on television. Uh, I was in Portland, and that was not the case in Portland. Um, <laughs> was in Seattle. Um, that is not the case in Seattle. Um, but fortunately here in Tacoma at least, we've, we've been very fortunate to have the police be very, um, I wouldn't want to say supportive, but it, very kind and to give us the benefit of the doubt when it comes to problems. So. <laughs> also draw a correlation. The more disruptive of the 1%, the more retaliatory are the police force. It's a direct connection. I think I also have to respond to that, um, to that directly. Here in Tacoma, uh, we, have an, we have an advantage over many other occupations, I think, not just because of the size of the city and in comparison to the size of, um, say, Seattle or Portland, but um, here on our Tacoma police, police Force, we have several um, unofficial supporters. They recognize that we are all in, all in this together, essentially. So I think that has a, that has a major effect here in Tacoma. Um, they're, they're kind of on our side. <laughs> Um, uh, our occupation's land is also state land. It's not a public, uh, it's not run by the city of Tacoma, so that may be another reason for the cooperation that we're seeing. <laughs> this one, oh, oh, I just wanted to say that um, I, from my perspective, never having been involved in these kinds of movements, my, my sensitivity is to the, our responsibility, and I think that the, this movement, that Occupy Tacoma, has been singular in its, in its sensitivity and its insistence upon being absolutely nonviolent. I've noticed that I had my son walking in this, this Occupy Seattle uh, march not long ago, and he was all for it, and he's a corporate manager. Um, he was all for it until, as he was walking, people started knocking down garbage cans, and it, it just turned that line of aggression. And I think that that's where we have to be so careful is to maintain public support and to maintain that decorum that is so essential in people's perspective and perception of who, what this Occupy movement is about.
I was at a meeting the other night, and there was five of our city council members there, and the uh, subject was actually brought up, and um, there was no response. So there was neither a condemnation nor an approval. So we'll, we'll have, I guess time will tell, we'll just have to see. We have two questions that are about the media, so I'm going to read both of those and we have some volunteers. <laughs> One, what will it take for people and media to stop saying Occupy is just like the Tea Party? Oh. Is this just ignorance or deliberate confusion pushed on the public? Mm. Someone else says, question from Tacoma One Voice. Why or when are we going to drive 30 miles to Seattle to surround Cairo and Tacoma TV by holding hands and creating a circle around the studios? <laughs> 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 it looks like my uh, was I'll say something about uh, Occupy and the Tea Party. Um, there, is a, there is at one level uh, a certain similarity. And the similarity it comes out of this essentially a certain cynicism about politics and society. I think, I think that the two movements do share that. Uh, beyond that, uh, they are very, 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 very different. Uh, they have very different goals, very different interpretations, and very different backing. Uh, the media, uh, well, the media say, are, are actually comparing the two a lot less. And Occupy, interestingly enough, seems to be getting more press these days. Which I think is interesting and good. Dr. Lincoln, I don't know. Well, I was going to actually address the Tacoma Media, the Tacoma News Tribune. The Tacoma News Tribune, as you know, is, is owned by a corporation that is not here in Tacoma, it's in Sacramento, California. I've been uh, working with um, progressive causes or actions for the past 30 years. Very rarely will the Tacoma News Tribune give us um, uh, just uh, account of what's going on. For one example, just, just in numbers alone, what I, I've made it a practice when a, a press person asks me how many people are at an event, if there's 700 people there, I'll tell them 1,500, because then they'll say 400. <laughs> but, but, but that aside, um, it, it's very hard to crack the media in this town when you're coming at it from a progressive or social justice angle. And so it is really important for us, I think, locally, to keep the heat on the press here in town. Yes. We need, we need to hold their feet to fire. We need to make sure that they're also, but also, in, 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 a, in a friendly way, so that we collaborate with them as much as we can to get the message out. And if we can do that, that's happening. <clears throat> we share the analysis of Occupy Wall Street in terms of, I think, what they got right here, which is that this is a crisis that is not going to be resolved simply by elections, by lobbying, by litigation, by convincing the corporate media to carry our story. And no disrespect to the questions being posed, but really the beauty of Occupy is that we're sidestepping all that stuff, right? We, we're taking it straight to the 1%. That's who the ne negotiation is with. And media is a tool. Government is their tool now. We're sidestepping their tools. And ultimately, they will tell government, fix it. And that's when we'll see big social change. Happened with the civil rights movement. Happened with the, the labor movement in the 30s. Every movement. Uh, it's, it's the 1% who tell government and, you know, what the terms are about the, what the compromise is. It's, it's our role as people in this crisis to put the pressure on the real decision makers and have direct negotiations with what we're willing to compromise about with them. I think what's most interesting to me about this, this whole movement and it's so um, just so progressive is that 
we've never been in this position before. We have never had global access to information and communication. We've never in our history had the ability to build a community in this, at this speed, to, to raise a groundswell, to raise consciousness, to, to raise this sleeping giant um, ever before in our history. And this, if we don't take this opportunity and treat it as the opportunity that it really is, and give it the, the concentration and the focus and the respect, um, then we're going to miss an opportunity and we will have impact with that for the next generation. So my goal personally is to just, and, and again, I'm doing this whole thing, but my goal is to get in touch with everybody that I know because we can't rely on the media. We have to make it our personal goal to reach out that six degrees of separation. We have to reach everyone that we know in every means that we know. And we have a chance to do that like him with the <coughs> I wanted to go back for a second and talk about how um, Occupy is being compared with the Tea Party uh, movement. And I want to preface this by saying that my father is actually a member of the Tea Party movement. And so that creates a lot of interesting <laughs> dinner conversations. <for> <laughs> um, so, um, and I think it really stems, both movements stem from a frustration with the government. Uh, and I think that a lot of the differences that that are espoused in, in those movements are actually just a confusion over uh, the specifics of what we're frustrated with. Um, in talking with my dad, it began to figure out that, well, I may have been frustrated with the corporate influence on our democracy, and he was frustrated with the incompetence of our governmental systems. And we came to understand that those two things are intertwined. And so it, even, the, even members of the Tea Party uh, can find agreement um, that the system is broken, it's just we might differ on how we'd like to fix it, and that's all part of the discussion and the dialogue that we should be having on a regular basis. We have two opposing perspectives, so I'll read both and, and let you respond on civil disobedience. The first says, I'm concerned with the trend towards civil disobedience and violent acts, no matter what the provocation. I think our greatest power comes from holding the ethical high ground. I'm afraid we lose public support. I think the temptation to go one step further is there. And the second person says, being disruptive is important to get attention, but I wonder whether it is possible to help some individuals and families at the same time occupy homes under threat of foreclosure in support of the family of their Movements have to create disruption, but there are lots and lots and lots of different ways of disrupting. Um, from what I have seen of uh, various Occupy movements, uh, they are not the ones who have initiated the violence. Furthermore, uh, we uh, have to be careful about uh, the word violence. Uh, while uh, knocking over a trash can may not be the most desirable thing to do that is not really violence against the person. If you hear it in the media, it sounds like somebody hit somebody or something like that. Uh, you know, that's part of it. Uh, but uh, so in, in some Occupy movements, I think they did this in Seattle, where they actually did stage uh, an action on a house that was being foreclosed. So that is, in fact, the sort of a thing that uh, can be done if you have enough bodies, enough bodies to do it. And it's actually a practice that's very, very, very old in the American tradition. Um, it goes back at least to Shays Rebellion. This is 1787, when farmers in Massachusetts came to prevent the sheriff from foreclosing their neighbors. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit on the, the violence thing. Uh, as well, and um, there, the mainstream media does report some instances of violence or some um, occupiers uh, provocating police, um, but I, I'll preface that with the exact same um, statement that I made earlier, that statements by an individual do not represent our movement. Our movement um, came to consensus on a global scale that we are a non-violent movement. Um, and just to give you an example of that, I was in Portland recently during the eviction, um, and we had 
riot police, uh, fully militarized riot police with M16s and rubber bullets and horses. And we had a gentleman in our crowd throw an object at the police. And that's not acceptable for a vast majority of us. And so the crowd actually pushed that gentleman into the police's arms. So he was then arrested. So it's absolutely unacceptable for the majority of our movement um, to provoke any violence whatsoever. And it seems to me, um, from my experience, that the violence doesn't seem to break out until the riot police show up in full riot gear for tear gas. So it, it's, it's, it's confusing, and there's also, we have to define what violence is, because um, there can be things like verbal violence, and I think that's something that we definitely need to work on, because we can't alienate the police officers, they're human beings, and they're part of the 99%, they're part of our entire society as well. So, um, I'm, I'm very uh, against provoking police officers um, with insults. I don't think that that's a good way to have a discussion with them, and it's certainly not going to make them happy if they have to, if it's you, you know, standing between their, you and the gold side. I just don't, I don't think the movement is going to take a violent direction. Um, we tend to receive blows a lot more than we inflict them, so. I just want to add something. Uh, I was just reminded that on December 17th, we are actually going to be doing an action related directly to uh, foreclosed homes. And it's going to be a march. Uh, more details will be available on OccupyTacoma.org. But um, it basically will be in order to raise awareness of what's going on with the foreclosure in our local community and uh, an opportunity for those who have been foreclosed on to be able to stand up and say what they have to say and give their story. So just uh, keep keep close watch on OccupyTacoma.org for the, the details there. Just a question that's held dear to the crazy community. Uh, all major social movements, or maybe not all, but so many of the major social movements and the progress in our society as, as humans has been backed by those who are people of faith. In order for the church or faith to be relevant. You have to stand for injustice. Sometimes that takes civil disobedience. For example, in the civil rights era, many of those meetings to plan, to strategize, to come together, those happened in churches, happened in synagogues, happened in places of faith. It is to me, central and core for our spirituality to do whatever we can in order to fight injustice. And that means as people of faith, if it takes civil disobedience to be heard, to be recognized, or to move the question, that is our obligation. I think it would be also helpful for us to clarify what we mean by disruption by, with some positive examples. First off, um, occupying someone's home when a, a foreclosure takeover is in process, I would consider that the height of disrupting the 1% getting their profits, right? They're trying to take that home away from somebody because they're, they're going to make a profit off of that taking. But that can be done with humor. It can be done with love. It can be done uh, in, a, in a way that's really fun. Imagine we were singing during this, hap during this happening. Imagine we were singing and dancing. Uh, imagine that uh, a, a religious leader was uh, leading us in a prayer of some sort, um, you know, in full regale. Uh, a lot of, I've seen a lot of these actions which what we often call de-escalate a potentially violent situation. And, and this is something that we practice in, in civil disobedience and we train ourselves on is de-escalation, and, and, and there are ways to do this. 
So um, I, I just want to make a plug for Occupy Tacoma at this moment because we are planning, or I shouldn't say we, Occupy Tacoma is planning a singing and dancing disruptive event <laughs> on Black Friday. And, uh, I don't know if I'll pass this to Autumn or Sean, if you want to give a little detail, because we, we, I think there's an interest in passing around. No, no detail. But there's an interest in <laughs> Pastor Barney has a sign-up sheet, and we need a lot of folks. Do you guys want to take more of how do I get involved? That seems to segue pretty nicely. Yeah, actually, if you want to get involved, come to the park. Come to our GAs. Uh, we're at the park all day, every day. Somebody's there. And our GAs are every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, GA means General Assembly. And those are Wednesdays at 6 p.m. at the Red Room. And on Sunday evenings at 6.30 at... Uh, 621 Tacoma Avenue. First United Methodist Church. And the end of that was, I'm so busy. How do I get involved with a small park? OccupyTacoma.org. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, honestly, I. I'm For a 23rd Tacoma, it's a building with a giant piano on top. It's an all ages music menu. <laughs> There's a diversity of movements and diversity of organizations, and diversity is great. Uh, different organizations make decisions differently or structure differently in terms of relationships between activists. Jobs with Justice and Occupy Tacoma are structured very differently. And for those who are interested in a, in, uh, a different kind of structure, we have monthly organizing committee meetings it's the fourth Tuesday of every month at the Electrical Workers Hall. And many folks plug in by going to our website. I also have the Jobs with Justice I'll Be There pledge card. There are about a thousand folks in Pierce County signed up on this card. It basically says, I'll be there five times in the coming year for somebody else's fight, including my own. And, you know, we call you. And we let you know where to show up and what the plan is, and that's the, you know, that's how we operate. We try to make it easy, easy entry point. And, and just to touch on that, how, how an individual can get involved, um, the most important part uh, about being involved for us is having a dialogue with those around you and um, doing research, uh, not necessarily just watching the news as far as your information is concerned. Go on the internet and research things like. Um, credit default swaps and Federal Reserve banking and, you know, all, all manner of things. Um, just becoming more informed and having a dialogue with your family and your friends is the most important part of this movement because it's going to help to incite good conversations which will help affect change. So you can also go to the website. We have lists of needs down at the occupation and we, we post events and things of that nature. But dialogue is extremely important. One of the criticisms of the Occupy movement is that it lacks focus. Do you think this will develop over time? How do you see the Occupy movement helping improve our economic situation? Now that people have occupied places, what's next? What are the demands? What does Occupy see as the next step? And if Occupy is the first step, what's the second? <laughs> um, so, that was a lot of questions. Um, as far as um, our movement lacking direction, I would caution um, to not be so hasty with um, making that judgment because typically social movements take years to, to get started and to get to the point where we're at currently. So, we're still developing and we're still growing. So, as, as we grow, we're going to come to a certain amount of focus. But like I said, our movement represents a variety of viewpoints and a variety of concerns. So yeah. we may never come to one specific demand or one specific concern um, because of the nature of our movement, because we have to represent a myriad of different viewpoints. So that's, that's one of those big things. And as far as where the movement would go, I can't speak for you know 
the entire movement, but I personally, um, in line with with the disruption that we we're trying to cause, I would like to see it evolve into something like a national work stoppage or a national workers strike. Um, I think that that would be very effective in terms of getting the one percent to negotiate with us. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, demands. Uh, it's a, it's a social movement about a lot more than just the economy. Uh, the economy is uh, crucial in that it sets the environment in which it happens. Um, I, I have spent a lot of time, much more time than I should have, uh, following any number of Occupy websites. And one of the things that has struck me is that as you go back to the blogs and you look forward, uh, you get ever more informed and ever more uh, sophisticated mm -hmm. discussion and analysis. Uh, I think that that is one of the goals of the movement. That's not the sort of a thing that you can tick off on a list, uh, but in many ways, everything else falls from that. that the lack of focus is actually our strength, personally, um, as we both addressed it, is through the education. I think the ultimate goal of this is just to educate society, to educate everyone that came, comes after us, and those who set the trail before us that got us you know, where we are today. Um, I've been answering questions exactly of exactly that nature. What, what's, your, what's the purpose of this? What is this about? You seem to be fragmented. Well, we may not have one concrete vision or one defined gripe, but I can guarantee that the one percent doesn't agree entirely on what what makes them happy, um, any more than we can agree on what makes us stressed. Um, what's important is that if the one percent were feeling stressed, they would do something about it in the form of lobbying, and they would, they would take care of it. It's time for us to step up and do exactly that, which is take care of it. I think also the lack of focus of the part of, part of it is, um, it, it's, it's part of the media trying to get a three-second soundbite or a three-second society. That, that's, that's one of the problems. The, the, the other thing is, in many ways, it's not a problem. Our country, there's a systemic bankruptcy in our country of justice, of fairness. And it is such a broad thing that has happened over these last 30 years that you can't address that with bullet points. So to have this wide open question, I think in some ways is very healthy for self-reflection for our society. And I think it's important in fact, actually, I like it. I think it's very important for the Occupy movement to stay that way for a while. And that way, we can have a conversation of self-reflection to address the systemic problems that are going on in our society. Thank you. There are lots of good questions here, and we promised a public forum, so I'm going to put this up for a, for a democratic vote. The choices are continue with the questions that are on the note cards and risk running out of time, or hand the microphone over to you. Can you please raise your hand if you're up for number one and would like to continue with the note cards? That's uh, kind of 10 inch, 10, 15. Raise your hand if you'd like the microphone. <laughs> Can we take the microphone one? Can we take the microphone one? <laughs> All right, so I apologize for those who, um, who didn't get their question answered. And maybe one thing I'll do is pass them around just in case you guys get a chance to deal with them. Well, <laughs>
let's take, begin lining up in the back. So I will take the wireless mic. Right or right here? Oh. Alright, so right here and down along the line. And I'll go ahead and stand with the wireless mic. <laughs> So if you would like to have the microphone for one minute, join the line. And uh, while we're saying that, students who feel they need to leave, and I've noticed a couple, there are some sign-up sheets for the classes that you need to sign up for on the chair in the back. I think my students are covered, but there are other classes that <laughs> It's also especially important that you voice your concern, your question, especially if you disagree, like that we just don't want a bunch of of yes, yes men and you know positive things. We we like some challenging questions and some disagreements as well. So that's important. Don't don't feel like you're going to be booed or anything like that. Okay, one minute per person, and we'll end it up. Thank you. Okay, so looking. Uh, I think this is probably for Dr. Foreman or anybody else because they can answer it. Looking at recent and not so recent history and uh, pulling from one or more revolutions or movements. What phase do you think we're in in our movement? And what else do you think will need to occur for the Occupy movement to get to the other end and see some change? I would say that the Occupy movement is very much at the beginning phase. Uh, it's going to take a great deal of talking amongst uh, people in the movement and beyond the movement, uh, and a, a lot more I like the you have to have, when you, it's, you have to have rallies that could fill a stadium. You have to have the 99 percent. I think in order for us to get to the next step, we're going to have to see a lot more awareness, a lot more um, outrage from the average individual, more interest in what's going on in any occupation anywhere and why they're doing it than uh, there is interest in things like American Idol. <laughs> My name is Tom, I just have a quick comment. Uh, you know, Al Sharpton, I think, said it really well. Like, what, what is, uh, you know, what are the demands of this movement? And I kind of said, look, this movement has changed the dialogue, okay? When, when Occupy Wall Street started, they're talking about, you know, are we going to cut the budget a little bit on social costs, or are we going to cut it a lot? You know, and, and they have this, uh, uh, Patty Murray is on this budget cutting committee, right? She's one of the co-chairs. And um, that, that whole discussion, I mean, it was, it was heading in exactly the wrong direction. So the whole narrative in this country has been shifted. So we've already won, is what Al Sharpton said. Uh, I don't understand the uh, significance of the Guy Fawkes masks. Um, uh, to me, they seem to represent uh, violent overthrow or revolution or actions, and uh, that seems to be uh, directly opposed to what the uh, movement stands for. If people want to uh, be anonymous or not recognized, uh, there must be mas masks of Gandhi or Martin Luther King. <laughs> I hope, well, hope you don't buy them at Walmart, but uh, <laughs> got to be something better than something that uh, that expresses a violent uh, action. So please help me understand why why a lot of people are wearing those. Um, the guy Fox mask. I don't think its intention is to be a reflection of Guy Fox as a person. It's more become a symbol of a counterculture, especially among youth. Um, it's also a symbol readily used by the online hacktivists, uh, I don't want to call them an association, but anonymous, that I think you've probably heard a lot about them. Um, so it's not so much that we're trying to relate it to Guy Fox and what Guy Fox attempted to do, um, it's that it's become a symbol of the counterculture and a symbol of our awareness of corruption. And um, it also is a way for people to get together and they can all put on their masks, and it's a way of saying there's, you know, we're all the same when we're wearing this mask. You can't judge us by what we look like behind the mask. It's just kind of... Perception is reality. And, and, and if uh, people are marching through Tacoma wearing those masks, and people driving by in their cars see them, their perception is the reality. 
And, so you get, I mean, it's. And, and, and I, would caution, I would caution you to reserve your judgment um, on what those people are doing, not by what they're wearing, but on the actions that they partake in. My name is Baylor, I'm with Occupy Tacoma, and uh, one of the major concerns is violence that's been brought up, and I wanted to address something. Um, the fact is the media, the news media, almost automatically attributes all violence that takes place with anarchists. Okay? Anarchists, the pure definition of anarchy has nothing to do with violence. Nothing. Nothing. And it concerns me that any time any kind of violence ever happens, even though the person who's committing the violence says nothing or has any, no symbo symbology to indicate that they are anarchists or real anarchists, it's automatically assumed that their behavior is anarchist in nature. I am an anarchist. I'm deeply involved in this, in this movement. I have been in every march with Occupy Tacoma. There has been no violence. I have no intention of bringing violence. And I just wanted to emphasize and ask Occupy Tacoma panelists also, they understand the pure meaning of anarchists. All right? Anybody can engage in violent direct action. Socialists, communists, Democrats, Republicans, anarchists. That's violent direct action. Just because you're an anarchist does not mean you're violent. I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, field one of these questions that we received up here. Um, how many people in this room stand with the Occupy movement, and can we get that with a show of hands? I'm not sure who asked the question, but there's your answer. Yeah. 
And instead of Starbucks, you could go to Satellite Coffee or one of the local <laughs> I'm sorry, I just want to comment on that. Starbucks actually is one of the corporations that does take care of their employees. They put their, they put their employees through college. They, they take care of, they, you know, come on. Let's, they let's, basically let's, funded let's, the anti-legalization campaign in Washington. <laughs> Starbucks profits from prison labor. This just isn't getting enough coverage. That's what I'm saying. And I hate it when I go uh, I'm talking to a cashier, might be anywhere, and, and I said, have you heard about uh, Occupy? Occupy what? They don't know what I'm talking about. I hate that. <laughs> so, it was my idea uh, for everybody to encircle Cairo or Como, those are my two choices, it's a 30 mile drive to leave Tacoma. In fact, we could even get involved with the Seattle people and double the numbers. You know? So encircle that building uh, in a very nice way. They don't know us personally. I think they should get this media, the ones who are everybody watching on TV, people are home right now watching television. They're not here, they're watching TV. So we need to get our voice out there through the media more. And so we need to hold hands and circle those buildings. Pick one day. You guys can pick it. I don't care. <laughs> you like to touch it. I can't wait to talk to you. <laughs> so, uh, I think we should do that. I'm not a leader. You guys will have to leave me over there. But we're all leaders. We're all leaders. Every Tuesday at 6 p.m. at Dorky's Arcade at 9th and Pacific, there's an action work group that meets for planning just such actions. I think it would be a beautiful thing. Oh, sorry, thing. it's seven. It's seven o'clock. I think it would be a beautiful thing, and those people will get to know us personally. We're not just going to be somebody they're talking about on the news. They will know us. We will talk to them. We will communicate with them. That's what I want. Okay, my mind is up. Hi, I've got a quick statement first. Are we actually just point fingers or point fingers and also take responsibility. For as the mortgage statement went here, I bought a seven hundred thousand dollar house making fifty grand a year. Whose fault is that when I lose that house? But I'll also say along with that question, something has to be done and what's being done is appreciated. But we also gotta take responsibility. We can't just point fingers. On that same note, we also have to take responsibility for having allowed things to get to the point that they are currently. We should have been we should have been paying attention a long time ago. Um, I would like to say something about that. Uh, I agree with you that we all have to take responsibility, but uh, we also have to realize that the phenomenon of regular people like myself over borrowing uh, was actually systemic. The uh, uh, neoliberal economic arrangements here, the free market arrangements uh, that were put in place beginning with the Reagan administration and expanding through every administration up to now uh, were essentially an effort to produce economic growth and profits. The problem is you produce stuff and you need somebody to buy it. During this period of time, wages did not go up sufficiently to buy the stuff that was being produced. So if you wanted the stuff bought, it had to be bought on something else. Lo and behold, credit served that purpose. But it, of course, could not do it forever. Before you jump in, I just want to talk about my mother for a second. She's filing for bankruptcy. My mother has paid her credit cards over three times over the balance. Paying, and, and I know there are people in this room like this. And I have struggled with her for decades about her spending. She's a working class person. And there's a sickness in our society around consumption. And my mom's got it. I don't. I don't know, you know, but 
I work with her like twice a week. She lives 3,000 miles away from me. And this sickness is not going to be get over soon. But there's something really wrong here when these multi-billion dollar companies are making my mom pay three times over the balance of what she borrowed. When we, when we measure our, our success or our, our confidence as a country by consumer confidence, when we're entitling, when we're titling one of our major sector um, health by calling it consumer confidence, we know that that's where we're we're, we're supposed to be as consumers, and that's where we've been placed. That's where our emphasis is on, and we have to move away from that. My name is Casey Kolchak, and I'm a student at the University of Puget Sound, doing some spirit figures at the University. Yeah! And I would just like to recommend uh, for this group to use the University as a resource. We have one of the best college radio stations in the country. We have a great college newspaper, and plenty of students who are looking for ways to get involved. And so I'm sitting right over here. If you want to get in contact, I'll be right there. Thanks. change things, that it gets that ball rolling and gets the change started. Uh, huge question. Uh, I think we probably shouldn't uh, equate the occupation as a movement with a particular tactic of camping out in public spaces. In, in some ways, the occupation movement is already helping. Uh, it changed. We we are uh, talking about and answering and asking questions that we wouldn't have dreamed of asking a year ago, and that's a big step right there. What happens in the future, nobody can know. But hopefully, the occupation movement is either the movement that does change, or is the catalyst to get a movement that does make the change. Um, uh, so um, I had a two two people very recently. I had a friend of the family who. Uh, came over last night and a friend of mine who was on Facebook and there are just two problems I have when people who do, aren't very aware of the movement come and, and I ask them because I do ask them you know what do you feel how do you feel about this and the most common response I get is people these people need to have jobs and and the other uh, common response is who's ever in charge needs to figure out what they're doing so what my question is to you guys is how do you respond to those kind of things? Because those are really important questions that a lot of people who don't understand the movement are asking. My first answer uh, when someone asks or, or makes a comment about um, the unemployed being a part of the movement, my answer is uh, several of us are not unemployed. Um, some of us have several jobs, in fact. Um, that, you know, and then as far as any other criticisms, um, if, if you don't agree with, with how we're trying to make this change, yet you do agree that there is a need for change, come and show us what we should be doing. Please. <laughs> yeah, we don't need I'd, like to, I'd like to talk also about that. Um, uh, they say, you know, you guys need jobs, get a job. We get yelled, that yelled at us uh, quite often, actually. Um, and for youth and young adults like myself, the unemployment rate for adults ages 18 to 29 is around 50% right now. So, I mean, that's national. That's that's a huge problem for getting the job. That's really bad. And then as far as the, our leaders need to figure out what's going on and fix the problem, I think that's indicative of a problem with our system where we look to our leaders to say, hey, please fix the problem for us, and we don't look at ourselves and think how we can help fix it. And then some of us are 52 years old and have a degree 
and a good background in, say, tax or real estate, and we still can't get a job, we have to rely on a career that is predicated by the economic crisis. I think the whole thing about uh, getting a job is, is a um, thing that uh, part of the one percent is trying to get the media to uh, get it great into our consciousness. Whereas in the sad reality, if you look at look at look at an action and see the incredible diversity of people that are there, there are unemployed, there are students, there are, there are workers, there are laborers, there are professionals. It is a massive cross section society. So when I first came up here, I didn't know what I was going to have to say, um, but I figured I'd figure it out because I thought I'd be lying. And this is actually what I figured out. Um, the 1% are not somebody to be negotiated with. They are part of the populace just like we are. And I think that it's very important that we understand that there's a democratic system put into place that requires the people to agitate from the outside. We are the foundation of the governmental structure that we have in this country. And it has been hijacked from us. So I was just kind of concerned about the conversation we were having here as in us and them, first of all, being divisive. And the second part is if we're gonna take some responsibility, people, then we need to understand that we are the foundation of this democracy. We are the agitators. It is our responsibility to wake up and take charge. And for me, that's what Occupy is about. I'm not here to negotiate, I'm here to play democracy the way it was meant. We just have a few minutes to go and I'm going to ask at least five people to speak before we get responses and I'm hoping you guys can just go ahead and write down if you want to remember something. Um, I wanted to make a comment and then I have questions. Um, first comment, Guy Fox mask, um, I think a lot of it has to do with um, not just the fact that people are united under it, it's an idea, it's the idea that an idea that we all have in common is bulletproof. Um, and that we're all united in that way. And my quick question is, um, you talked a lot about how um, the lack of focus um, is kind of a strength and a good thing because there's a lot um, going on in healthcare, unemployment, um, etc. But um, I personally have put all my hope in this is going to be the one that changes the world. Um, and I was just wondering, um, is, are there plans or um, propositions of like laws that have been proposed to senators um, or some kind of like physical action to protest that have been put forth to the actual government? To just answer your question real quick, there are. <laughs> there are. And we're just going to, actually, we're going to let everybody get through and just make you guys have to handle your pens joint as well. Indeed, we put together a uh, ideas for how we could fix the federal budget deficit and did a protest in front of Patty Murray's yesterday until one of her aides came out and took our ideas and promised she was faxing them straight to Patty Murray. So we also have a people's legislation. We are working on changing the system from the inside out. But that's all I came to say. I came to say that if you can't make it to the Black Friday event, we have a national call to action. It is Occupy Your State Capital Day on November 28th. Many of you may know that is the beginning day of the emergency legislation that is going to decide the $2 billion budget cuts across the, uh, every state goes into legislation on that day. And in every state, they will be occupying their capitals. And if you can't come out to be a part of these actions, if you can't come to the park, we have a live stream. We try to be on there 24-7. We keep the dialogue going as much as possible. And you can always come on and ask your questions there. Thank you. Oh, and enjoy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marilyn. And the first thing I wanted to say is, I agree about the failing. There's different types of anarchists. It's like different types of religion. You're looking at an uh, anarcho-syndicalist. Do I look like a violent person? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I could be your man. <laughs> <laughs> now, the next thing I want to do is just to kind of honor about a local thing that has been brewing in people's minds for a long time and it kind of simmers below the surface. And that is we have Channel 12, which was supposed to have dedicated public access TV time. Public access does not mean shows that are put on by click 
or just listening to the city council. It's supposed to be public access. So exactly. perhaps we should start thinking about that. Hello, everyone. I'm James McGill. The last night we were in a meeting to Occupy the Hood. And uh, we came up with two concrete goals that we wanted to work on. Actually, they just really wanted to force, they really wanted to just talk about one, but we kind of snuck the second one in there. We had to it. Number one, jobs and second is education. Uh, we met over at uh, Shiloh Baptist Church. Uh, and that's where the, where the meeting took place. And we will have another meeting in two weeks. And uh, along with that, uh, we have another thing that was going to, that is being connected with that, uh, which is starting a state bank. And we are working on the, the chart for that. I think in Seattle they're starting one already. <coughs> so we're trying to get some more information about that because the underlying concept with that is microfinance to see what can be done in reference to small businesses starting in local, getting finances for those uh, businesses so we can create our own jobs. And then when it comes to education, we're concerned about uh, the, uh, I need to stop. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Um, my name is Thomas Green, and this uh, question is mainly for faculty here at this university. I'm a student here at this university. Um, uh, one point I like to make is don't talk about jobs to me unless you talk about livable wages that go along with those jobs. <laughs> Second of all, has a student ever graduated from prison or from going to jail? <coughs> this is my senior year and I'm planning on doing some civil disobedience, but I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
should have brought this up when I was up here last time, but I have a talk show on, on KUPS, and I would love to put that together. So if anybody would like to be involved in that, uh, like I said, I'll be, I'll be right over there. Uh, I want to just add this on the live stream. Our live stream address is livestream.com slash OWS Occupy Tacoma. Just so, you know. I just wanted to say real quick, uh, thanks a lot everyone for coming out and thanks for your questions and you guys have all been great and I love you all. We also have our sign-up sheet for our Black Friday event still going around, so find Bonnie and she can be signed up. See me, see me. And that's it. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Can we go on live stream tonight? I don't think I can tonight. i got to get home and get this online. Okay. <laughs>